Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lillian O'Brien Davis. I'm the assistant curator uh, here at the Mackenzie Art Gallery, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, this version of Thursday Night Live, locating John A. McDonald. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land we are gathered on for this live stream, T Treaty 4 territory, is the homeland of the Cree, Soto, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and Métis people, and you are gathered where you are. So um, this programming is part of one of our current exhibitions, Connecting Through Grasses. Uh, the exhibition features the work of Christina Battle and looks at prairie grass ecosystems, as well as the technologies that map and reflect the diminishing biome. Connecting Through Grasses considers how we might both map and define prairie boundaries anew. Uh, so we're thankful to Alyssa Furon and the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba for organizing this exhibition. Um, and it is open to the public at the Mackenzie Art Gallery until February 20th. So we invite you to uh, come for our time ticketing and socially distanced visit. Um, I'd like to welcome our three speakers tonight, artist and researcher Christina Battle, uh, architectural designer Dana Salama, and artist, activist, and teacher of Cyrus Marcus Ware. I'm thankful for these three people um, to, for joining us tonight um, to have a conversation about the problematic history and the policies of Canada's first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, uh, whose role in the institutionalized violence and racism in this country has sparked debate in recent years from coast to coast as we question the tributes uh, still standing to honour his legacy. Uh, in our communities. Um, so there's a Google form that is on the Facebook group, um, or sorry, Facebook page um, that's been circulating. So we invite you to check it out, uh, but we'll be referring to it um, to, during this conversation and we'll post it in the chat as well. Um, I'd also like to recognize the local activists and artists who have been working hard to draw attention to this problematic history, including David Garneau, Jerome Melacan, Alex King, Evening Star Andreas, and Kelly Belgard Apunachau. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat on all platforms for questions from the speakers um, at the end, uh, but I ask that you remain respectful in your comments and interactions, and remember that there's a person on the other side of any username. Uh, so now I will stop talking and turn off my camera um, and invite um, our speakers to um, uh, join in conversation and share their thoughts. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks. Thanks, Lillian, for the great introduction. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I'm going to awkwardly um, share my screen. So bear with me for just one second. All right, so I can't really see what you all are seeing, um, but hopefully it is a map. Um, thanks everyone for being here, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I feel like um, I'm very exhausted, which I'm sure everyone is, um, but it sort of just keeps on going, the exhaustion. So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to get sort of re-inspired and recharged through this conversation. Um, my name is Christina Battle, um, and I thought I'd give you a sense of sort of where I am, where I'm coming to you from. We're all in three different territories, or maybe four different territories as we're speaking to you through this talk. Um, so I'm in Amasquatchi um, Waskaikan, which is also known as uh, Beaver Hills House in Cree, also known as Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, more specifically, I'm in Nakota Iska. Um, Edmonton has just recently uh, renamed its boundaries or its ward boundaries and names based on indigenous names. Um, so Nakota Iska, which is also known as Ward 1, um, which is Sioux for the people. Um, I'm really grateful to be living and working on this land um, and also to be thinking about what it means to live and work in this land, especially through this project, through our conversation together. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this project that I've been working on uh, since the summer that's now up at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina um, called Connecting Through Grasses. And maybe just to situate a little bit of how this relates to thinking about Johnny McDonald. 
Um, I've been thinking a lot about the borders and boundaries that have carved up this land that we're working on. Um, as the first premier, as Lillian mentioned, of Canada, um, Johnny McDonald was very much responsible for contributing to those borders and boundaries. So this image that you're looking at is a map from 1889. I think, I don't know a lot about um, Johnny McDonald's history, but I believe he was prime minister until about 91, 1891 or so. So this is, would have been how the um, land was carved up under his reign. Um, and I've been really thinking about monuments as sort of thinking about um, lasting evidence. So monuments as evidence. Um, and as well as boundaries or position markers. I wanted to share this map um, as sort of an alternate view of thinking about how these boundaries and borders might be seen otherwise uh, from the amazing resource nativeland.ca um, if you're not familiar. And I believe we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, this tool and this amazing um, website. And as well as boundaries. Um, but just the importance of thinking about how we might come to imagining this land or thinking about these borders, the way that we separate one part of the region um, from another in different ways. Uh, so this is a screenshot from the website that's based on territories. So thinking about those who have lived on this land um, since time immemorial and how maybe looking to their regions and footprints might be a different way to think about how we move and shift these boundaries. So the project that I've been um, invested in thinking about looks to prairie grass ecosystems as a way to think about grasses and how they might be an, yet another way of thinking about boundaries or position markers. Um, perhaps we can also even think about them as monuments. Um, this is a map of the grass, the prairie grassland as it exists in the region today, um, it is of course quite diminished. Um, more than 70% of Canada's prairie grasslands have been converted. So imagine if this colorful um, sort of abstract blob of uh, representation of grass prairie land looked 70% larger than it does in this map. Um, perhaps we might uh, think about that as a marker or a boundary, a way of thinking about our place within and upon the land. Um, so this project is really invested in thinking about the prairie as a site um, of endangerment. So uh, one of the things that I think is not so well known, but should really be known, is that the prairie um, habitat or ecosystem is the most in, one of the most endangered um, ecosystems in the world. It is most certainly the most endangered habitat in Canada or on this land. Um, and I think you know, not really talked about in such a way. So I was really interested in thinking about how we might approach thinking about this crisis, this disaster, um, from a position of sort of working through it in participatory means. So how we might be able to spread this idea of thinking about this diminished biome differently and how we might contribute um, to shifting conversations around it. Not to say that I expect um, that we as individuals are going to solve this problem on our own, right? We really need um, larger changes and larger shifts to happen in order for this to be addressed. Um, but maybe just starting to think about it together um, and working together, doing a thing together might help us rethink how it is that we approach and find solutions for um, the situation that we find ourselves in. So the project works with specifically three different prairie grasses, um, Little Blue Stem, Canada Wild Rye, and Side Oats Grama, which are both natural to the region, to the prairie region. So colonially defined by the borders of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. If you are living within those, um, those boundaries, uh, these are grasses that you should see a lot more of, um, but probably don't. And the project primarily takes place um, over the internet and through mail. So I'm really interested in thinking how we might find and shape communities to think through these problems together and work on these things together um, at a distance. Um, sign up to take part in the project through a website that I'll talk about maybe in a second. Um, I'll send you a pack of grass seed in the mail. Um, and then you're asked to plant the grass seeds wherever it is that you're located within the region and then map the locations of where it is that you've planted those seeds on a collective map. Um, this is a snapshot from the map. Uh, 
maybe taken a, couple, a few weeks ago. I'm not sure. It's constantly changing as um, not so much over the winter uh, since we started taking a bit of a hiatus of planting seeds. Um, but it constantly changed as the project initially began in October through the fall. Um, and individuals have been planting their seeds, making a mark on the map to show and reference where those um, seeds have been planted. Sometimes there's images that are added to it, sometimes little descriptions of why those locations are important or um, what those locations are in relation to. Uh, and then the goal is once the summer comes and next summer and the summer after and the summer after, we may begin to start seeing um, and sort of using satellite technology to view the evidence of these grasses as they've been planted across the region. Um, and maybe thinking about how these grasses can help us think about boundaries and borders and new. Perhaps they can even become monuments themselves. And the project is ongoing. So as I said, it was disrupted by, you know, the climate and weather, sort of natural. It's nice to have a bit of a pause from being able to plant all the time, I suppose, time to reflect on it. Um, but if you are interested in signing up and you happen to spend time within or live within this region, um, you can access uh, the sign up page through the Connecting Through Grasses website. And um, as the exhibition and the, the larger sort of body of work tied to this project is up at the Mackenzie Art Gallery, I think through uh, February or so, we're hoping that others will start signing up throughout the next couple of months. But you can continue to sign up for as long as I have seeds to share. Um, and I'll send you a pack of seeds through the mail. And then you're just asked to um, map those seeds as you plant them, and also to receive a number of emails from me. Um, that might change in the coming uh, season, but the way that it operated in the first iteration, every week you'd receive an um, email from me that talks a little bit about some of these concepts and ideas. So thinking about borders, how we might imagine them differently, how grasses might help us do that. Um, and then also there's a link to the project um, through satellite technology and thinking about not only the way that we're using satellite technology and online systems to map where we're planting these seeds, but also how the satellites that are flying, I don't know if flying is the right word, passing us overhead at every given moment um, are capturing and imagining and creating images of the land and how that might also be um, a sort of mapping that misses out on some of the things that are happening on the ground level. Um, so each week in the first iteration, I sent tables, timetables showing when Terra, which is one satellite that's monitoring um, the Earth for environmental purposes, uh, when it would be overhead of these three regions. And then you're asked to sort of think about what it means to be under the gaze of the satellite as you're redistributing these seeds on the land itself. All right, I'm going to stop there and then um, leave it to conversation as we go. Thanks, Christina. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, hi everyone, my name is Dana Salema. I'm an architectural designer and researcher. Um, in professional practice, I work at a participatory design firm on uh, heritage conservation and, eco and ecotourism projects in North and West Africa. Um, many of them which unpack post-colonial tensions in the built environment. Um, I have the privilege of living on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Um, uh, Tokoronto is now home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island. Um, so I'm currently the co-steward at the Architecture Lobbies to Toronto chapter where we are completing a participatory mapping project and research partnership with 221A, which is an incredible artist-run center. Um, and that's sort of how Christina, Cyrus, and I came together. Um, together with 221A and uh, developer Victor Temperano of nativeland.ca, uh, we're working on a participatory map, which locates tangible spaces and objects within the territory known as Canada, represented by figures and events, 
um, be they political, social, economic, or otherwise, that have contributed to the dispossession of life, memory, and territory, and resources of BIPOC communities, both past and present. Um, similar to Christina's incredible work, our, object, our objective is to reveal a network of colonial monument spaces and events um, the map we're building isn't just interested in monuments, but also sites of urban renewal, environmental racism, et cetera. Um, and our shared goal is to build an intersectional platform which recognizes relations between memories, events, and built spaces, which have contributed to the oppression across the, which have contributed to oppression across the territory known as Canada. Um, this is an image of nativeland.ca. Um, which is an incredible uh, resource to explore territory, traditional territories, languages, and treaties um, around the world. Um, our hope to begin with is that folks participa participating in today's event will help us to identify spaces, places, and objects which memorialize John A. McDonald in our environments. Um, John A. Macdonald represents an important microcosm in Canada's racist and colonial history as Canada's first prime minister and as someone who orchestrated genocide and sexual violence towards Indigenous communities on this land. Um, the data collected will be added to a beta version of this uh, map, which we're hoping to launch in the coming weeks. So today I want to examine architecture's complicity in enabling the prominence of statues in our cities um, through one particular example, which is the John A. Macdonald statue in Toronto, located at Queen's Park in front of the Ontario Legislative Assembly building. Pictured here is the statue with its sculptor, Hamilton McCarthy, who also, um, who's also responsible for the residential school champion Egerton Ryerson statue only a short distance away. And in July, 2020, McCarthy's statues of both Egerton, Egerton Ryerson and John A. McDonald in Toronto were simultaneously splashed with pink paint um, and protesters called for these colonial monuments to be torn down. Today, John A. Macdonald is obscured behind boards with only his bagged head visible. Um, as architects, what we're interested in revealing through this mapping process is how statues reinforce and are reinforced by uh, colonial hegemonies in space. So this is a map of Queens Park, uh, future home to the Legislative Assembly building and statues of John A. Macdonald and other problematic figures which were erected on its grounds to fortify the state's presence. Um, and here you can see to the east is Tattle Creek, um, uh, which is a forgotten stream that was polluted and buried by colonizers. It now runs under the University of Toronto. Uh, Queen's Park itself was the first municipal park in Canada inaugurated by the Prince of Wales as a leisure ground. Um, the park and adjacent properties have also been tied to the University of Toronto grounds since U of T was established in 1827. So uh, both the university and the crown literally molded the land to become a symbol of their constructed histories and institutional presence in the city. Um, formal colonial languages are rarely original. Um, like power itself, they're constantly reproduced ex and exported um, to colonize land in order to establish a transnational identity and a symbolic order. The statue of John A. Macdonald itself borrows tropes from other tyrannical statues. For example, uh, the employment of a pointing finger to imply, uh, to build a relational language to the land and imply it is the figure's domain. By pointing down or beyond from its pedestal, the statue builds a permanent hierarchy with the observer. Um, I want to argue that the discipline of architecture has intentionally reinforced these hierarchies over time. So as Mabel O. Wilson notes, 
in the 19th century, architecture was a body of knowledge that was institutionalized within both a profession and modern universities. This all emerged alongside colonialism, which fueled the wealth of Europe and enabled the construction of museums, theaters, and government buildings and their statues. Uh, architecture's function was in part to house the modern nation state and modern liberal society. Beyond the construction of monument objects, architecture and its practice contribute to staging colonial objects in our environments. As a group of architectural workers, Tal Tio is interested in how our discipline has reinforced these power relations over time. And if spatial practitioners operating in the built environment um, can incorporate systems of repatriation or reinterpretation into our practice. How can these symbols be disassembled over time and what will stand in their place? So pictured here is the city's current University of Toronto secondary plan, which establishes uh, view corridors around Queens Park Circle. Um, Maintaining the visibility of John, a. Mac, of John A. McDonald's statue and the legislative assembly building uh, behind it. Today's successive planning efforts have ensured that the node occupied by John A. McDonald is one of the most visible in the city. His statue frames and is framed by the Ontario Legislative Building to the north. Uh, circled in white are other statues occupying Queen's Park, such as Queen Victoria, anti-Semite George Brown, as well as various war and police memorials, all designed to paint a strategic and selective picture of Canada's early days, ind erasing Indigenous histories in the process. Buildings around Queen's Park reinforce its hierarchy with large setbacks from University Avenue and formal language shaped by its edges. There have even been monuments created to frame John A. Macdonald and the promenade to the Legislative Assembly. Uh, so pictured here is Manufacturer's Arch, uh, no longer in existence, which was built in 1901 to commemorate a royal visit to Toronto. In 1929, the city attempted to model itself after Baron von Ausmann's urban renewal plan for Paris which demolished the old city fabric and expropriated land to create boulevards too wide for revolutionary barricades, as well as to establish a few corridors for state monuments. The widening of University Avenue was one of the only parts of the 1929 plan ever to be implemented. If fully executed, the 1929 plan would have built a roundabout and war memorial known as Vimy Circle directly south of Queens Park at Queen and University. The new boulevard would have connected Vimy Circle to John A. Macdonald and Queens Park to the north. In this sense, the city was also rebuilding itself and its identity around Queens Park and its memorials by extending this presence south. So John A. Macdonald's statue appears to be a totally static object, vigorously maintained by state actors in the face of protest vandalism. Yet the long history of protests and civil disobedience on this land have left no mark. The statue and the public land it sits on, as well as the forms which surround it, stage a partial history predicated on a particular colonial agenda, deemed more immutable than any prior or subsequent political event or movement countering this version of events. One of the features we will be implementing on our mapping platform is the ability for people to propose new monuments to replace the old ones. Um, I think it's worth asking ourselves whether people are too fallible to act as subjects for future monuments, and if anything should be built for permanence. Or perhaps through commemorating a plurality of events and experiences, we can begin to literally obscure or build over old monuments. So, what would John A. Macdonald look like if he was nearly covered in protest signs and paraphernalia, or if concrete was poured into uh, it, his current wooden shell? How would the landscape around the monument respond? And how can architectural practice itself facilitate changes? Um, so our hope is through is that through this Google Form the Mapping Project, we can begin to collectively ask these questions. 
Um, if you're interested in learning more or joining the initiative, please join the Discord server, which I'll share in the chat. Um, and uh, we will be sharing the beta version of the map in the coming weeks and asking people to begin to add data. Um, so we highly encourage your participation and your feedback. Uh, thank you. Hello, um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cyrus marcus Fair. I'm coming to you from Tacronto, from the part of Tacronto that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase and is the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, this is Three Fires territory and territory covered by the District with One Spoon Wampum. It's also part of Treaty uh, 13. I'm going to uh, share my screen as well. Um, and, uh, oops, here we go. Okay. So um, I'm a, an activist and an organizer, uh, an artist uh, and a professor. Um, I have been an organizer and an abolitionist for 25 years and have been involved in organizing in particular in particular in the movement for black lives, uh, you know, for the for the majority of these past uh, 25 years and all of the different iterations, including uh, currently uh, as a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada and also a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. Um, this has been uh, quite uh, the year, uh, and this summer was uh, quite the summer. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, uh, did a, a several uh, large scale uh, actions this summer um, aimed at trying to draw attention to the need to uh, tear down monuments to slavery and colonialism, the largest one being uh, the police and uh, prison system in so-called Canada in this north part of Turtle Island. Uh, we painted a large scale mural, 7,500 square foot mural on uh, College Street that said defund the police. Uh, and then uh, we we also organized uh, a demonstration uh, wherein uh, what you see on the screen uh, was one of the results. Um, this is an image of Johnny McDonald with paint uh, uh, on uh, the, the base of the statue uh, on Juneteenth, a very significant day within uh, Black communities, uh, a day that commemorates the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, but also several particular rebellions uh, that happened within uh, Black uh, labor on enslaved labor camps. Um, and it was a significant moment and um, it uh I'll talk a little bit more about what happened uh, in, in particular in, re in relation to this. But first of all, I'll start by saying I, I am an artist as well as being an activist. Uh, as an artist, I've been really interested in creating uh, and imagining future worlds that look vastly different than the ones that we're living in today. So I created a project for the Toronto Biennial in 2019 called Ancestors Do You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future with Michelle Lau. And this project was uh, aimed at uh, imagining a world with a vastly different architecture, a world that didn't actually have a lot of buildings, that didn't have a lot of uh, government structures, but rather was an open space, a space that was rooted in freedom and self-determination and accessibility and liberation uh, for all people. Uh, Black and Indigenous people in this future have survived, and thus we therefore know that everybody has if we go based on what the Combahee River Collective suggests, that if you make the world safer for those who are most marginalized, you are necessarily making the world safer for everybody else. So in this project, um, I imagine that our great grandchildren in 2072, you figure out a way to use old technology to patch through into the past and uh, directly into the Ryerson image wall uh, to send us a message uh, of what they need us to do in order to ensure uh, their glorious and free future. And they ask us to dismantle some of the architectures of our society, like uh, capitalism and white supremacy, upon which our entire uh, uh, system is currently uh, armatured. Um, 
Um, so uh, uh, this project um, uh, imagined a future that was uh, vastly different than the one that we currently are in today. I've also been really interested in this idea of borders and coloniality. I did a project for the Biennial in 2019 um, that is also going to be brought forward into the 2021 Biennial called Antarctica. It is actually about the real life story of 11 people who uh, were sent to Antarctica to be born to stake a future land claim. Uh, that's where the truth ends and the fiction begins. And I tell a speculative fiction story about uh, just what would happen if folks were sent to colonize again uh, another uh, continent. Would humans ever realize that colonization was never okay? Uh, it's all about white supremacy. This is the set uh, and environment of the installation. And there's also a 30 minute play that takes place in this installation. Uh, everything is white, uh, symbolizing the snow, of course, but also the white supremacy that is rampant in a society that would continue to try to find somewhere else to go and colonize uh, in order to make way and safety for a, a, a slim few uh, rich, white, uh, cis, able-bodied uh, folks. So um, uh, this uh, play, this performance, this installation, um, uh, again, uh, offered a different uh, imagining of a, of a society that was rooted in a slightly different uh, armature, a different our architecture, uh, you know, the activist who uh, who is pictured here is the main character, Sabian, and she is an activist before she gets sent to Antarctica, and she decides to start her own revolution because she doesn't believe that what they're doing is right. So um, these are the actors who performed in the play. So as an artist, I've been really interested in both uh, the idea of our uh, architecture, but also the idea of uh, futurity and uh, the idea of borders and the idea of migration. Um, and of course, uh, this year, I have had a lot of opportunity to see the blending and a connection between my artistic practice and my activist practice. This year has been uh, incredible. We saw, uh, you know, uh, first of all, this pandemic uh, caused uh, sort of this shutdown and, uh, you know, people sort of talking about taking care of each other. And then we saw this uh, revolution uh, break out with uh, people crying out, enough is enough with this police violence. It's time to defund the police. It's time to respond and say uh, enough of the white supremacy already, uh, you know, that you are the largest monument to slavery and colonialism. Uh, it's time to defund the police. It's time to reinvest in our communities. Uh, Black Lives Matter protesters um, this summer uh, faced this response from police and law enforcement. So they used uh, the architecture. This is at the Capitol. Uh, they used the architecture. They weaponized the architecture and made the stairs now a dangerous place. The stairs become no longer a place for sitting and for viewing, a place for access, a place for, you know, they, they no longer serve their intended purpose. They now are a place for violence and a place for uh, some Something that is about to, to happen. Um, the response, of course, yesterday, uh, what we saw at the Capitol just shows how different architecture is uh, engaged with when you are a white supremacist versus uh, uh, anybody else, uh, you know, on uh, this planet. So um, have been very interested in uh, the ways that the police, uh, we, we were doing all of this organizing to try to draw attention to the ways that the police were uh, brutalizing us. Uh, we saw many deaths happen uh, this summer. Um, we saw uh, widespread riots and uh, demonstrations, both uh, from our beds, you know, through disability justice activism, and also in the streets, uh, as you see here. And uh, we saw a tremendous violent response from the state, um, and, and they reacted uh, with, it, with immense force. And again, of course, in dramatic contrast to what we saw yesterday, where they literally just opened the doors and let uh, white supremacists uh, come in and uh, sort of just move, uh, move along. Uh, 2020 was also the 10-year anniversary of the G20 uh, in Takaron. Uh, I had made this image uh, showing a, protest, uh, a protester being pushed into the ground at City Hall uh, by 
by a, a, a gang of police uh, with the nightsticks out, ready to use the ground as a weapon, ready to actually use the earth as a, uh, as a weapon uh, to try to uh, brutalize this, uh, this protester uh, in the G20. And again, uh, uh, you know, the way that the police respond uh, to our presence in public space, to our presence in society is, is, is over and over and over again, these violent uh, responses, uh, because that is the architecture that our system is built on, uh, an architecture of white supremacy. When it came to Juneteenth, um, when it came to uh, J July, when when uh, this uh, demonstration happened, uh, we saw a response uh, to the protection of this architecture over the valuing of human life. Uh, we saw the protesters, uh, you know, who uh, were arrested, uh, the, the, the attendees of the protest who were arrested uh, in conjunction uh, with this demonstration. We saw them detained and held uh, in a car, a hot car for hours, uh, driven around the city, uh, detained, uh, spent the night in jail, uh, denied medication, denied access to legal counsel. And again, uh, this is, of course, an image yesterday of a riot cop carefully walking a white supremacist down the stairs out of the Capitol building safely without any injury, without any harm, heaven forbid she trip or fall. Um, we put up uh, banners that said, it's time to tear down monuments that represent slavery, colonialism, and violence. And we were talking about these monuments to slaveholders, to genocidal, uh, violent perpetrators like uh, Ryerson, like uh, John A. MacDonald, like that bizarre statue of King Edward VII uh, in uh, Queen's Park, um, uh, but also drawing attention to, again, the largest monument to slavery and colonialism that currently still exists, which was the policing and uh, the prison system. And the violence and the reaction uh, that we got uh, to uh, putting a, a paint on an inanimate object uh, compared to uh, the reaction that white supremacists get whenever they do anything uh, that they do uh, violently in the city uh, is, is very dramatic. This is, of course, the image of the uh, equestrian statue in Queen's Park. Um, and again, uh, the, there was more interest in protecting uh, this bronze uh, statue than actually protecting the lives of the protesters who uh, were there. So I, of course, am showing you some contrasting images here intentionally, because of course, fundamentally, what is happening is that we are seeing white supremacy lay bare. We are seeing the architecture of our society uh, lay bare. Uh, this is an image of um, in Salt Lake City, uh, a BLM protesters also using paint uh, and one of the protesters uh, one of the people who purchased the paint is currently facing a life in prison charge, a life in prison sentence uh, for purchasing paint for uh, what is being classified as mischief. So you can see how the law is being uh, inaccurately and, and, and unjustly unequally uh, applied uh, and that continues to happen and of course this continues to happen here in Canada this is the RCMP again standing by doing nothing while the Fishers were being disturbed, brutalized uh, while their uh, catch was being destroyed in McMaggy. Uh, and of course, this is the result. Uh, you know, again, white supremacy, the police uh, participating and colluding uh, because of the structures of uh, white supremacy that our society is currently rooted on and based in. And again, this is in McMaggy with them sort of standing by and doing nothing. Um, Maybe I'll uh, sort of wrap there and say, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, intense systems and structures of violence that are propping up a lot of how uh, and what we do uh, in this place that we call, uh, you know, Canada in this northern turtle island. Uh, the police force is a, a, a rotten armature. It is rotting, a rotten armature that needs to be removed from inside. Our, this is why we're talking about abolishing uh, the police. This is why we're talking about abolishing a system that would allow the valuing of these statues of dead white genocide genocidal white supremacists over the lives of actual people who are trying to ensure that Black people have freedom, to ensure that Indigenous people have sovereignty, to ensure that disabled people have the right to live uh, long lives, to ensure that trans people get to be elders. These activists who are putting their lives on the line are being disregarded over and over and over again because we are Black, because we are trans, because of all of these things, because we are living in this white supremacist delusion. So um, I will end at uh, there. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Cyrus. That was incredible. Yeah, so, yeah, so. I'm getting yeah. a lot of feedback. Um, yeah. Are you hearing feedback when I turn my microphone on? When I turn my microphone on? I hear it. No. <laughs> I think we'll just have to make do with the minor echo and minor feedback. Yes. Better? Living in the Zoom age. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you both so much. That was amazing. And I love um, something, Cyrus, you just ended on of the white supremacist illusion and thinking about how, you know, like, what it means to be living within this illusion as well and how do we dismantle this illusion yeah yeah it's you know I was so um I hope I, I the reason why I, mean, I know we're talking about Northern Turtle Island today and I know that it's so important to have this work in so-called Canada because it's you know, any presumption that white supremacy isn't home here that the Proud Boys didn't start here that this wasn't you know our issue too uh, is is incorrect right so 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 I'm 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 definitely rooting this work in an understanding of Canada but I'm showing those images of what happened uh, in uh, in the capital because of course policing across North America uh, is very interconnected. Uh, they train each other. They attend conferences together. They 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 go to Israel together to do training. Like they 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 are in a, a tight gang, uh, and they are absolutely connected. And so the the ways that white supremacy is also uh, spreading and connecting and looping through uh, is it, it also doesn't have borders. <laughs> it also does not have borders. And so I think that when we see the events of what we saw yesterday, I hope that regardless of the fact that it was happening in a different country, I hope that it, it strikes fear and, and, and motivation for change in everybody uh, who is watching it from up here uh, to say, we actually have a huge problem because this is our entire society is rooted in this idea. Uh, the police opening the gate uh, happens here too, metaphorically. Uh, you know, this happens over and over and over again. The Proud Boys have been patrolling Vancouver Street for the last three years. And people have been saying, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And nothing is happening. Literally nothing is happening. You know, there was, uh, you know, gay men disappearing from the village here in Takaranto, mostly men of color. You know, and people were saying, what is happening? And the police did nothing, nothing. They, they allow particular things to happen over and over and over again because they are rooted in white supremacy. And this is why they can't be reformed, right? So anyways, Wow, what a week to have uh, to have happened, and then for us to be to coming together to talk about monuments, to talk about Johnny McDonald, to talk about borders, to talk about the mapping project, to talk about this exhibition. Like it's just such an interesting confluence that this would be happening right now. So I hope that it's a catalytic moment uh, for for folks. So if anybody has been wondering if. Uh, a, this is the moment to get involved or not, and B, if they need to, if you're not on board with abolition at this moment, uh, what do you need to read up on? What do you need to find out? More? What are your questions? What are your hesitations? And how can we talk it through together so that we can get on the same page? Because maybe change is coming. This can't continue. This is this is absolutely bananas. Cyrus. Um I think it's also important to communicate, and this is something that I've talked to you about before, is that um, acts of civil disobedience that are targeting monuments are often because often occur because the activists have already tried to go through a bureaucratic process to remove the monument, and that hasn't worked. 
I mean, Raven, I don't know if you saw, y'all saw Raven Wings' beautiful speech uh, in the summer, uh, but she's a, a, a Black and Indigenous um, a trans woman, and she, she's an organizer with, with me with Black Lives Matter. And, and she said, you know, uh, we, we've tried all these other ways, you know, we've written letters, we've done petitions, we've written books, we've done art projects, and it took doing this for you to actually come and listen to the fact that there's a problem here, you know? So she said it best, I think, you know, and I think it's, it's true, right? Like what else we are left with very little, uh, uh, we are left with very little options. People are dying. You know, people are literally, people are dying. I mean, when you look at these particular figures, Ryerson was responsible for not only architecting the residential school system, but also the apartheid system in South Africa, the death toll mounts to millions. When you think about the impact of these people who were glorifying, who were protecting uh, more so uh, than the bodies of activists who are saying, can we please stop killing black and indigenous people in the street? And and, um, Christina and I were also discussing um, the exporting, not just of of military and police technology, but also of the monuments themselves. Um, Christine, so uh, after the John A. Macdonald in Victoria was defaced, uh, Doug Ford offered to bring it to Toronto, or to Toronto, and uh, Christina was saying Jason Kenney did the same. Yeah, and um, my mom just sent me a text before our talk began that Jason Kenney Kenny apparently today reiterated his desire to bring the statue, the defaced McDonald statue from Montreal to Alberta. Um, and today of all days as well, which is a sort of doubling down of speaking to the actions that did happen in the United States yesterday and are continually happening. Mm-hmm. And there's something um, just, you know, obviously so absurd, but also that I find quite interesting about monuments themselves as these like monuments to these horrific individuals and terrifying individuals. But something that Dana, you had said about what ta- what might take that monument's place. Um, and then Cyrus, some, what you were talking about of imagining and thinking and speculating about different futures and how these futures might be different. And I love really thinking about the monument as material, as object, and what can replace it because I think it's actually quite an easy thing to imagine, right? Like it's easy, I think, for the masses, for public to think about replacing one structure with another structure. We see that all the time in our cities and urban spaces. Buildings are torn down, new buildings pop up. So I don't think it's a stretch to imagine how monuments might shift. Um, And then by extension, how these systems that um, are replicated and that the monuments actually stand in for, how might in turn also then begin to shift. I'm not sure my question is within that, but just I love this idea of thinking about what might replace. Mm-hmm. I did a project for the Bentway in the in the fall called Radical Love, and it was um, the call for for uh, when, when they approached us uh, was to think of a project that was about public safety, and I think because I had been thinking so much about what had happened in the summer. And I had been thinking about what would it look like to uh, to celebrate, um, in particular, Black trans women, uh, you know, and Black non-binary people who um, who are putting their their lives on the line. You know, as Sylvia Rivera said, you know, trans people do that because we have nothing left to lose. But you know, these folks who are really really giving it, it they're all you know, folks like. Monica Forrester, who's been doing street outreach for 25 years, you know, like every night, you know, just out there, consistent, uh, supporting her community, supporting our communities. Uh, and what would, it, what, what would something look like that would celebrate them and that would honor them and that would also do a, serve a dual purpose of also reflecting back uh, to the city, a trans presence, you know, um, that, that is a visible, a beautiful, uh, a thing, uh, which we don't always see ourselves reflected back in, in public space. So I created these monuments that, um, that were sort of geometric shapes with these images of these, of these, these gorgeous trans people just living their lives and being beautiful and, you know, just, uh, just celebrating them, you know, just celebra- celebrating their gorgeousness, I suppose, and all of the meanings of that word. Um, and then they lit up at night because, of course, the trans folks that I had talked to had said that 
you know, a lot of their safety actually came from being in the city when there weren't a lot of people around. You know, as soon as people were around, there was a potential for danger. So uh, 2 a.m. becomes more safe than 2 p.m. So I wanted something that was beautiful at night, also at 2 a.m. So they let up. So it was fun. It was a really interesting project. And it was fun to be able to um, imagine what a what a series of monuments to a decidedly different hero would look like uh, so soon after what had just happened with our team in the summer. Um, when, when I was doing a bit of research about John A. MacDonald at Queen's Park as well, I wondered what it would be like if we let the ecology take control of the site again. So what would happen if we, if Tattle Creek resurfaced and if it flooded the site, for example, and how powerful that would be as an act of repatriation? Um, because uh, John A. MacDonald was tied to the construction of the park and the construction of the legislative building. And so it's imposing this like, colonial uh, design upon the land. It, it isn't simply a statue, it's, it's tied to wider systems. And I think once you change that symbol on the site, the environment will respond as well. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why, there are so many reasons why I think a lot about grasses, but one of the things that I find really interesting about them is, like they literally, their roots are what are, is holding the earth together, especially in this region. Um, they also are what's responsible for this region being um, this sort of success at agriculture and these industries within this um, colonial country that we live within. And I find this sort of really absurd and like tricky irony within this idea that as um, the biome and the grasses are pilfered away and pulled away and replaced by agriculture, by farms, by industry, uh, what is actually valued by those industries and that agriculture within this region is also being lost. So at a certain point, um, taking away and stripping the land of the grasses is also going to be its ultimate downfall, ultimately, at least the, the system that um, dominates in the region so far. It's like Christina, an absurd your, joke. Your work also touches upon phytoremediation, which I think is really interesting because so it's basically um re remediating the soil if it has toxins or or if uh if the land has had an industrial presence uh just through uh just by planting grasses and specific species on a site and i think as an as like an architectural designer i find that interesting because phytoremediation requires a time scale that that uh, architects aren't used to. Um, so it, it like you need to occupy the land with grasses or or plants for a number of years. Um, and the sort of uh, development process that has been set up by colonialism uh, is sort of like antithetical to that. Yeah, that's why something, uh, one project you were talking about, Cyrus, when you're imagining the future, and I think it was like 2072 or thereabouts. I love thinking about how we might engage with action now by planting these sort of beginnings to be able to imagine a future that's much further away from us. Um, and how maybe, like for me, this is one of the things that I love about thinking about plants is that they do operate on this different time scale, right? They're not necessarily concerned with what's happening next year or the year after, but really thinking about lifespan in a different way and sort of imagining how it is that we might imagine that future, um, but in ways that prepare us to prepare for it now so that we can start building the structures now so that we can in 2072 um, see out this new future in this imagined space. And in this like idea of, yeah, I totally, you know, because in this idea of, 
systems change, right? Where you, where you, when you studied systems change and you, like when systems naturally go through their life cycles and they go through the period of systems collapse, which we are in now, um, you know, it, it is literally decaying, but nourishing the soil, you know, nourishing the seeds that have already been planted by our ancestors and nourishing the seeds that we're planting and, and allowing new things to grow in, in the place of the system that is falling down, right? So this moment is a, a very fertile moment, you know, in activism. We talk a lot about this as a very, you know, using a botanical kind of reference because it is a very, we are in fertile ground. It's also why it doesn't always feel great, you know, because it's like standing in the muck you know, imagine standing in compost. Well, you know, but 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 we need this because that's what's nourishing the roots for uh, for 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 all of the the generations that are growing out of uh, the plants that we're planting now. So that that to me feels like a very hopeful uh, thing to hold on to 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 imagine um, to imagine that 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 this hard uh, that we're going through now is actually going to nourish the roots for what is coming next. And I love the idea of just remembering that it's not just uh, like we have this, uh, uh, I think, uh, a way of imagining that it's always only ever been us. But our ancestors were also fighting and their ancestors were also fighting. And so the seeds have been, uh, you know, actually some of them are planted quite deep. Some of them are have been there for a century waiting for germination. And now we're watering them. So, um, you know, the freedom that is about to come and sort of burst forth if we continue the botanical medicine for the freedom that is about to blossom is is about to become so much more beautiful than we could ever imagine because it's not just us planting the seeds so yeah. it's almost sort of uh antithetical to colonial like extraction process too um and so i really like the idea of like the permanence of seeds or um sort of the downfall of our current system becoming something that like nourishes the earth. Mm -hmm. And having those strategies and plans in place for when we can ultimately make use of them as well, right? Like having them imagined already so that when things do collapse and um, are dismantled, which they will be, I mean, we're seeing that happen, we're living through it. We'll have something ready to pick up and put into its place. Um, I'm also curious about, um, Dana, some of the monuments that you've, some of the plans or imagined monuments that you've received and heard from others as like the way that people imagine how these monuments might be otherwise. Um, I'm, and you know, not that you necessarily, I don't want to put you on the spot to like describe one particularly, but you did provide two images of them. And I was really interested in how the materials that were used in order to sort of rethink those monuments. Um, so like protest signs as one example, as this like marker and evidence of now, of the past as being something that overtakes and reshapes those monuments in the future. Yeah, so, so that one um, I think came from just thinking about how the state is always able to write its own narrative, like no matter uh, what protests have taken place on the land, there's no trace of them left there. Um, and I find that really strange. Um, and it sort of like imposes a narrative on the land in that way. And, and that's what statues do. Uh, and then the, the concrete one, actually, um, I, I think I was thinking about uh, um, a tactic that's used by the Israeli defense forces in the Palestinian villages, uh, where they will like expropriate a house by filling it with cement. Mm -hmm. Like they'll literally fill the rooms with cement and then it becomes a marker in space um, of like a lost livelihood basically. And so cities are, have these houses that are just like giant concrete blocks basically. And it is something that is not easily, easily reversed. Um, and so I like the idea of using state tactics to deal with these monuments. Um, I also find it really interesting that when you ask someone 
what should replace a monument, they they often think of a person. Um, like, I, I always wonder what that says about our society, that we want people represented in the built environment and that people stand for movements. It's so interesting, right? Because, of course, when I, I imagine if we were, like, what would a decolonial... Uh, like black affirming um, all of the things you know monument be like you know and if we were to sort of decenter humans as the core of what's happening on this planet uh, you know what would it look like what would it look like and you know now that we're at that point where that we just passed where human stuff outweighs plant matter and living material you know we we're we've got too much stuff. So, so what would a decolonial, stat, maybe a decolonial statue is one that, that isn't actually made out of something that lasts forever. Maybe it's one that isn't large. Maybe it's one that, you know, has different properties that because it's more in harmony with the, with the environment. That it could also be made out of seeds. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say it could also be made out of seeds, like it could transform into this like growing object. Yeah, and I love the idea of uh, this new monument, whatever material it's made out of, seeds do this as well and plants do this, uh, but adapt to the times and change and shift with the times. Um, because some of the images that both of you shared about the monuments themselves, like when you really stop and look at them, it is so strange how static they are, right? And they've been static since the moment that they were placed in those locations in urban centers. Um, and just how not aligned with the way that society actually exists and operates that is. You know, we're constantly changing and shifting. Why are we building these monuments that don't? It's quite bizarre. <laughs> I mean, it's not bizarre. We know why, but <laughs> perhaps we can think about it differently. Yes, and this, you know, Octavia Butler idea, you know, all that you touch, you change, all that you change changes you, the only lasting truth is change, et cetera. Mm -hmm. She sort of says in that book, Parable of the Sower, you know, that in the future, which she's writing about the now, because she was writing in mm -hmm. 92, but she was writing about this period right now, everything is going to change. And then as soon as you get used to it, it's going to change again. Mm -hmm. You get that, it's going to change again because, of course, you know, embracing change is the only way that she suggested that we were going to be able to survive in the, in the future that we've built for ourselves. You know, one that re requires a radical adaptability, you know, because of climate change, because of everything, you know, because the state is falling, collapsing, you know, we're going to have to be very adaptable. So she suggested that change we needed to really fall in love with change, make peace with change. Uh, so yeah, why why stick to permanence at this point? Exactly. Like this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was trying to find a good moment to step in. I just could listen to you all night, but that wouldn't be fair to, to you. <laughs> um, so I say wanted to, to jump in and say thank you. Um, I would have been monitoring the chat for um, questions and I haven't seen too many come up. I think this is something that uh, my partner texted me saying that he was taking notes. So people are like digesting this. And so maybe we'll get back to you with some questions um, in, a, in a little while because you have to sit with this stuff. But there were a few comments. Um, someone said several folks have suggested that Regina's John A. McDonald statue be replaced by native plants, which resonates quite well with Christina's project. Um, and also the kind of lack of permanence that you were just discussing. Um, uh, yeah, that, so there is a, um, a lot of folks responding really well to that idea. Um, but yes, I wanted to thank you so much for your time and your energy, especially um, after the couple of days slash entire year that we just had um, being on Zoom for one more Zoom talk um, is, is um, takes energy. So um, I've shared the Discord um, in the chat on YouTube and Facebook, as well as a link to Raven's um, statement that she made, because um, I, I think it's a great one, as well as 
the Google form. So um, anyone who's uh, interested can check out those resources. Um, and I want to thank Cyrus, Dana, and Christina so much uh, for their energy and their presence tonight. Uh, so good, have a good rest of everyone's evening. Happy Thursday. <laughs> um, and take care, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for a great conversation. Feel re-energized. You too. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Lillian. Bye.